I'm going to talk about um, the process. Maybe it's a bit ambitious for 25 minutes. Uh, but I'll try to give a broad perspective on how economics have got this embedded from culture and the biosphere, uh, and which, which is the scope and limits for the ecosystem service concept as a leading concept of sustainability to actually re-embed um, economics within the biosphere and within culture. I've divided it in five blocks. Um, I will first provide a little bit of background about what I call uh, the divorce between ecology and economics. I will talk about the three different levels of engagement with uh, valuation of ecosystem services. I will raise the controversy about the commodification of nature. And I will end up with a discussion that hopefully might pave the way for a discussion afterwards. So, a little bit of historical background to start with. Um, why do two concepts, ecology and economics, to which the old Greeks gave the same etymological meaning, end up in such a clash as we are witnessing today? An important thing to note here is, the, is that this is partly uh, the outcome of a given uh, historical development in the theory and practice in the theory and practice of economic science and it hasn't always been like that if we think of the first uh, unified school of economic thinking like the physiocrats they believed that um, all wealth derived from land what we could call nowadays natural capital um, so nature was very central in their analysis not because they were environmentalists but because they lived in an agrarian economy so that depended very strongly on natural capital Still among the classics, if we read Marx, Ricardo, Adam Smith, um, you will see that nature uh, still holds a very distinct position uh, as one of the three main uh, inputs to the production of wealth. Um, they also started to talk about ecosystem services with other words, uh, contributions of natural forces, etc. But they always did so as use values. Uh, they never thought this could be um, appropriated privately and exchange in markets, because they were public goods. I will get back to this later. However, already with the classics, they start moving the spotlight from land or natural capital to labor as the main source of the creation of wealth. Uh, so actually, nature starts having a secondary role in economic analysis. And this process is completed with the establishment of so-called neoclassical economics, which still nowadays uh, is the hegemonic school of economic thinking, uh, which is, uh, has been hegemonic since the, since, the, uh, since the end of the 19th century, which basically removes land or natural capital out of economic analysis, um, departing on the assumption that um, as natural resources get scarce, innovation and technologies will always allow to replace or substitute uh, scarce uh, natural resources for um, technological solutions, uh, basically meaning that there are virtually no limits to growth. So two points to keep in mind here. One is what we could call the post-physiocratic um, uh, epistemological break. It's when economics ends, uh, ends up thinking mostly in physical terms to start thinking mostly in monetary terms. And then the so-called marginalistic revolution, which is when neoclassical economics um, establishes as the dominant school of thinking, and basically nature is totally put out of the picture. So what is the corollary of this historical development? Um, the situation we have now is that economics is no longer concerned with the totality of costs and benefits um, of um, the environment that are important for human well-being, but only with a small subset of them. Namely, those that fulfill the following conditions. They must be useful for humans, they must be appropriable, so if there is no sort of excludability, it's not uh, of the interest of economics, because nobody is willing to pay for something you can get for free. And they must be able to be expressed as exchange values, as monetary values. So everything which is outside that smaller box is invisible uh, to conventional economic accounts, and it's what economists call externalities, right? External effects or external costs, which can be either, either negative, such as pollution and resource depletion, or they can be positive, as for instance, uh, ecosystem services which are not mediated by markets. So what is the kind of solution which is proposed by the so-called market conservation? If you can get the prices right, 
by putting uh, values, economic values on these externalities and then design the right economic incentives, you will be able uh, to align sustainability interests with market forces that would be pushing in that direction. <coughs> Let us put an example. I guess most of you will be familiar with the classical um, cost-benefit analysis with and without externalities. So for instance, the decision maker which is faced with the decision of whether or not converting a mangrove into a shrimp farm, a conventional cost-benefit analysis would tell him or her that the shrimp farm will give many more benefits. But what happens if we take into account all ecosystem services which do not have an explicit price and which are not mediated by markets? According to these authors, this would be already changing the balance. But what happens if, in addition, we also take into account the negative externalities uh, stemming from uh, the unaccounted replacement and restoration costs of the degraded ecosystems? Costs that nowadays uh, corporations externalize to society as a whole while they privatize the benefits of these activities. As you can see, the picture changed uh, very much. So what was the kind of core conclusion from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment? Basically they said, over the last 50 years we've been able to increase dramatically our capacity to provide so-called provisioning services or ecosystem services mediated by markets, but this has happened at the expense of all other types of services, of regulating, cultural and supporting and habitat services. And the sort of message that comes out from the Millennium Assessment and from the TIB report is this idea that ecosystem services are neglected in decision making because they are not explicitly valued. And this is identified as a core driver of biodiversity and ecosystem loss. But there are different levels at which, at which we might engage uh, with valuation of ecosystem services. Using the TIB jargon, we could think of recognizing value, demonstrating value, and capturing value. And I'm uh, organizing what remains of my presentation around these three levels of engagement. So basically recognizing value is what the MA did with this conceptual framework. They were saying um, we have to show that nature is not only a matter of ethics and aesthetics, but it's also the very material foundation of human life uh, and non-human life and well-being, right? Um, so basically in the millennium we did not see so much um, monetization, etc., etc. It was only uh, this metaphor, adopting this metaphor of ecosystems um, as a sort of natural capital that would be delivering services to human well-being. However, maybe the Pandora box was already open because this economic metaphor of capital and services was already there and we don't know if we can get now the genius back to the bottom. Uh, there's a, level, a second level of engagement uh, with this approach. Um, So-called new environmental pragmatists uh, say it's not enough to make a sort of uh, qualitative or conceptual recognition of the value of nature for humans. If you want to make a difference, the argument goes, you have to put some numbers there. You have to demonstrate that this actually uh, provides uh, certain benefits. Um, so this is what happens very much uh, with the TIB report, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. By 2008, uh, it's very obvious that um, our attempts uh, to reverse biodiversity loss, the, the things we signed in 1992 for the Convention on Biological Diversity, have been a total failure. Uh, we, didn't, uh, we did not uh, manage at all to, to uh, break down uh, the loss of biodiversity and actually it's, it keeps accelerating. So at this point there is an increasing part of the um, environmental movement that buys into this so-called new environmental pragmatism that basically says, okay, we have failed with ethics and aesthetics, um, so if we want to make a difference we have to adopt the valuation language um, that is used in decision making, which in a capitalist economy is money, right? So unless we can codify our, the conservation message um, in, um, in economic terms, we won't be able uh, to actually make a difference. Um, and most of you will be familiar, uh, for instance, with uh, Costanza's um, and colleague's study uh, on economic valuation um, that led most people to work uh, on ecosystem services valuation to use the money metrics as the way um, to approach value. But what is actually value? When I ask my students every year, what is the first word that comes to your mind when I ask about value? Uh, they always say money, 
this is interesting because it shows how uh, successful uh, as economists have been in colonizing uh, this much broad concept or notion um, of value. So actually, this has been so to the point that um, in the ecosystem services discourse, value is very often misread as denoting uh, merely monetary value. But for instance, if we have a look at the authorities of language, such as, for instance, uh, the, Oxford, the Oxford Dictionary, we will see that value is defined as the regard uh, that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something, right? So much broader than the idea of value as money. But um, moreover, you also will always have this definition of values as held values, meaning, as for instance, Kai, uh, among others, have been pointing in the literature, that values do not only derive from individual preferences as we might express them in markets, but also from the principles and convictions that guide the way we believe is the right way um, to behave towards nature and to behave towards other in our mediation with nature. Um, so basically the key word here is importance. And if we want to have a comprehensive picture of the importance of nature for humans, we might need to combine different valuation languages. We might not be able to find a single method or a single metric uh, that can uh, give us the full perspective. So as someone puts it uh, quite bluntly, Maybe a cynic is a man who knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. In the TIB report, um, I was trying to map out which were the valuation languages I believed were important um, to address the complexities of the importance of nature. Um, here we had the whole uh, tool set of economic valuation. We have been, for instance, environmental economists have been developing for decades. Then we managed to squeeze with a lot of resistance from the economists this box of so-called social valuation, at this point uh, not very well developed, but in the last few years, thanks to, again, to Kai and others, uh, it has really opened up this box, and really now it can be said to be standing on an equal foot with, for instance, economic valuations and others. And, I, and the so-called insurance value, which we might relate to ecosystem resilience, which uh, to some extent gives the temporal perspective, in the sense that we might have an ecosystem that provides many different services, but if the system is fragile, if it has lost um, key species that sustain key functions uh, for ecosystem services, etc., cetera, um, these systems might be very vulnerable to a disturbance and can collapse with its services and with associated values. Last but not least, we should not forget uh, the sort of objective basis uh, on value as well. So nature, uh, ecosystems, and the services they provide are important for humans, whether or not uh, we perceive it, whether or not we are willing to pay for it, right? We all need clean water, we all need clean air, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in the last few years, we've been pushing, for instance, also in the uh, intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, this notion of integrated valuation of ecosystem services, where we actually try to combine and to deploy all these different uh, valuation languages. Uh, that, for instance, here are grouped in three main families, ecological values, social cultural values, and economic values, which, of course, um, is, should be understood only as ideal analytical categories in the Weberian sense of the word. Of course, these are overlapping, and we could have uh, other combinations. But it's a way of showing how different services combine uh, or relate to different uh, types of values. But there is still a third level of engagement with the ecosystem service approach, uh, with evaluation of ecosystem services. And here things get even more tricky and more controversial than in the previous step. Um, some authors say uh, it's not enough uh, still to demonstrate, to put some numbers on the value of nature. Unless you design some institutional structures, some um, economic incentives that turn these theoretical values into real cash flows, uh, you will actually not make a difference in people's daily uh, decisions and daily behavior. And in principle, there are many uh, approaches we could use um, to build up this institutional assemblage. We could think of public policy regulation. We could think of economic and market-based instruments. We could think of uh, community-based regulation. But in the spirit of the times, um, the family of instruments, of economic instruments that have been most privileged over the last couple of decades are the so-called market-based instruments. Um, this has to be understood also 
uh, in the context of uh, the rights of this so-called second uh, generation of environmental policy instruments um, that basically starts elaborating this narrative, this discourse about the inefficiency of the first generation of public policy uh, based regulation, saying, oh, this is top down, command and control, rigid, etc. Um, and rights as the alternative of these so called market based instruments, which are more flexible, more adaptive, um, and they say more. Uh, respectful for freedom, no? because it's not a sort of top-down, state-driven uh, sort of policies. So this is a discourse that is elaborated very strongly during the 80s and during the 90s, um, and that nowadays is uh, one of the central sort of tenets um, of international sustainability policy. And which are the main uh, families of policy instruments through which uh, this approach is being implemented in practice? On the one hand, we have the so-called markets for ecosystem services, uh, which are pretty much based on the polluter-based principle. Carbon markets, biodiversity offsets, uh, wetland banking are some, some examples of it. And on the other hand, um, on the other side of uh, the coin, so to say, we would have uh, what we call for payments for ecosystem services, which would be based on the reverse principles of uh, Stuart Getz principle, right? Um, so the controversy is served. There's a lot of discussion in the literature going on. You have proponents or advocates of market-based instruments saying uh, that these are more, more cost-effective and more flexible, more capable to collect resources from the private sector, and more likely to create win-win solutions between development and conservation objectives. Critiques, on the other hand, are uh, raising a number of issues. For instance, uh, they make the case that external payments can destroy or, or erode the intrinsic motivations for conservation, promote unequal access to land and resources by privileging those with ability to pay rather than willingness to pay, and contribute to undesirable commodification of human nature relations. And this is one aspect where I would like to put a little bit more of emphasis, the issue of commodification, because actually the expansion of markets into domains of life uh, that have been traditionally um, governed by non-market uh, values and non-market norms is maybe one of the most significant um, developments of our time. And nature is one of the playing grounds where this is um, happening very strongly. Uh, but why is so much controversy with the commodification of ecosystem services, with turning ecosystem services into commodities that we can buy and sell in markets? After all, it's nothing new, right? If we think, for instance, of provisioning services, we've been selling and buying tomatoes and wood maybe for th several thousand years, and apparently that was not so much of an issue. Why do, we that, why do we react much more strongly when we commodify, for instance, or why is it more controversial to commodify regulating services or habitat and supporting services? Well, one first thing to note here is that maybe when we sell tomatoes or timber, Maybe what we are commodifying is not so much the tomato or the timber as the human labor which is involved in the production of those goods and services that are sold in the market, right? Whereas what we do, uh, for instance, with uh, carbon markets and payments for ecosystem services, we are simply appropriating work, which is not done by humans, but it's actually done by nature, and we are allowing people through property rights to derive a rent. So. Um, this is interesting. This is the sort of notion that led uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon in the 19th century uh, to regard the private property as theft when it was encroaching upon the commons, upon the ecological commons, which were actually the ones uh, he was studying. Actually, if we look what the classical said uh, about this, uh, this notion that we can uh, appropriate um, these uh, common ecological commons on a private basis and sell them in markets is something very new um, in economic thinking. So if we, if we see, for instance, what uh, the classics said about this, um, they never they, they recognized ecosystem services, avant la lettre, the, the, the name itself didn't exist, but they used all the terms. But as I said before, they only recognized them as use values. They did not believe they could be uh, privatized and sold in markets and just uh, I think it's interesting to pick up, for instance, this, um, this sentence by uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, uh, early 19th century, when he says, uh, the, wind of, uh, the wind which turns our mills and even the heat of the sun work for us, but happily, no one has yet been able to say the wind and the sun are mine and the service which they render must be paid for. I think it's an interesting uh, sentence to pick up 
uh, two centuries later when payments for ecosystem services have become uh, one of the cornerstones of um, environmental uh, science and policy. Uh, so why do I think uh, that this perspective on which so much hope uh, it's being put, uh, the idea that market forces uh, will actually uh, make us advance towards sustainability, why do I think uh, this perspective will actually fail? I think it will fail because there are at least four to five fundamental limits um, to this, uh, I believe, uh, to the efficacy of this approach. The first one uh, relates is what I could call for biophysical limits and for what we could call the uncooperative nature of uh, environmental commodities. So unlike bricks or shoes or other human-made commodities, uh, these so-called environmental commodities uh, cannot be just simply separated uh, from each other um, and create like discrete um, sellable units, right? This is something we can do so, we can um, um, break down ecological complexity in a given number of ecosystem functions and services for analytical purposes. But in reality, this is an analytical fiction and when you try to operationalize this uh, in markets, it's actually uh, quite complicated. Um, some author says that this is one of the reasons why the attempts of um, uh, privatizing water in the 1980s in UK um, to a large extent failed because it was very, it was the idea of the, the attempt to create uh, discrete sellable units uh, clash very much with the complex nature of water cycles. Um, the second limit is also uh, related to the first one. It also has to do with the biophysical character of ecosystem services. And they are the institutional limits. And one thing we have to uh, remember here is that uh, markets have always been effective in governing uh, private goods, but not so much uh, in governing common pool resources or uh, public goods um, because of their conditions of rivalry and excludability. We won't get into the details here, but those of you who are familiar with institutional economics, uh, I guess you know what I'm talking about. But basically, um, it's more states and collective action what we will need um, in order to uh, govern those ecosystem services which are not private. And basically the private uh, ecosystem services are, are only those which are already governed by markets, which are so-called provisioning services, right? We also have these technological limits. I take these slides from another friend of the Resilience Center, Jakub uh, Kronenbeth, uh, which came up with this very interesting study which shows how uh, also the technological um, limits to the valuation approach. As you might see, this graph if we stop here, it could be uh, quite similar to the one that Kai uh, showed uh, before. But it's not about ecosystem services. It's about the rise and fall of so-called economic ornithology a hundred years ago. We started to use exactly the same type of argumentation we're uh, using today. We should preserve birds because it's uh, profitable, because they, um, uh, they will repeal pests and so on. But then what happened? What happened here? Any idea, any guess? We came with an invasion with where the pesticides. So suddenly we had a cheaper solution than uh, protecting birds in order to uh, fight against plagues, etc., etc. So the whole theoretical edifice that had led to thousands of publications, etc., etc., just crumbled down. Uh, you could no longer make a case for the profitability of um, conserving. Um, of this bird management to uh, repeal pests, etc., etc. Uh, another type of limits refers to political limits. Um, we know that increasingly uh, people are contesting against uh, commodification of ecosystem services because uh, it also involves restrictions in access. Uh, and especially many indigenous communities, for instance, in Latin America, are organizing against red and payments for ecosystem services um, because uh, they believe it encroaches on their historical and customary rights of access to land and resources. And sometimes this, this can get uh, into high levels of conflict. So, for instance, if we think of the attempt to privatize water in Bolivia in the early 2000s, it ended up in a social insurrection, actually. So it can get actually quite serious. Um, but finally, where I would like to put most weight is in the so-called uh, sociocultural limits, in the cultural limits uh, to commodification. Um, and here is where we have a whole bunch of people, um, 
conservation biologists, deep ecologists, etc., reacting to this uh, shift in the spotlight from intrinsic values to instrumental values. And there are several things here. One is uh, the merely ethical aspect. We know that some people uh, or, or every society has always wanted some things not to be governed by market values and norms. No? So for instance, uh, when, we, uh, when this idea gets hegemonic, we actually manage sometimes not only to ban specific forms of commodification, but actually to decommodify things that were in the markets and that we managed to extract from the markets and put on, on other types, under other types of uh, values and institutions. Let me give you an example. Um, in Catholic countries, I was growing up in a Catholic country, for instance, uh, we had this widespread practice in the Middle Ages of selling spiritual indulgences, right? So if you were a sinner, you could always uh, pay uh, the church a certain amount of money, depending on the price, the, the, the severity of your sin, and you could actually get rid of your sins. This was maybe some kind of proto-economist that realized this externality uh, of the spirituality and designed a very nice way to internalize it in the market. Um, of course, the Protestants came and said, oh, this is totally wrong. Uh, this should not be governed uh, by markets and by money. This should be governed by spirituality. So you decided to um, actually uh, abolish uh, this practice and, in, in fact, decommodify uh, spirituality. So in our postmodern times, we do no longer buy and sell spiritual indulgences, but we increasingly buy and sell environmental indulgences. So as long as you can pay for your pollution, as long as you can pay uh, for your destruction of nature, then you are allowed to trade uh, with this carbon, uh, with this pollution, uh, and with this destruction of nature, as we, de as we do, for instance, in biodiversity offsets. Uh, one last point. Mm, there's a lot of uncertainty with regard to how uh, this new rationale for conservation, based on profitability and the idea of external payments, uh, what kind of effects it will have on intrinsic motivations for conservation. Um, this is what we sometimes call motivation crowding out effects, right? Um, and the notion is that differently from what sometimes we expect from this oversimplistic model in economics, which assumes that an external incentive will always reinforce the pre-existing incentives. What we know from experimental and behavioral economics is that intrinsic and extrinsic motivations can actually interact in very complex ways. Sometimes reinforcing each other, but sometimes destroying each other. Uh, the debate was opened by this classical uh, study that I guess uh, some of you know, by Ignizia and Ruscini, that documented how um, in a kindergarten in uh, Tel Aviv, in Israel, uh, parents were always arriving late to pick up their children. So at some point, the, the teachers decide to put a fine on those parents arriving late, with the counterintuitive uh, effects that parents started to arrive even later. Why? Because actually what was a fine, which has a sort of moral connotation that you are something wrong, was taken as a price, which is a sort of neutral thing that, okay, I'm arriving late, but I'm paying my sin, so I'm done with it, right? The interesting thing is that when they tried to remove uh, this fine, they did, not get, uh, they did not manage to go back to the initial situation. So apparently, these effects can also be irreversible, in, at least in the short term. Um, of course, we cannot extrapolate kindergartens to uh, ecosystems. But uh, in the last few years, we've also been reviewing what's the empirical evidence out there. Um, and some studies show that, for instance, this one in Chiapas, that actually this motivation crowding out effects uh, took place with payments for ecosystem services. And in a paper we published just recently, we show that actually um, there are an increasing number of papers that are uh, finding empir empirical evidence of this destruction of intrinsic motivations for conservation through monetary payments. So it, they actually change the logic and the way people think about nature. So in this sense, um, I like to quote uh, Hannah Arendt when she says, the problem with modern theories of behavior is not that they are wrong, but that they could actually become true. <laughs> Last slide, I think I'm, um, I'm talked uh, too long already. A few key messages here. Value means importance. Understanding the value of ecosystem services and biodiversity involved acknowledging different value types, different valuation languages, each one with their own logics, with their own metrics, and with their own valuation techniques. There are different values in nature that are not commensurable with each other. 
nor in money, nor in energy, nor in labor. Ecosystem service valuation can be a very powerful tool uh, to raise awareness about values that we sometimes take for granted. But when we use um, economic valuation, for instance, beyond uh, its scope of uh, its adequate scope uh, of application, for instance, we use it uh, to, when we put economic values into ecosystem services that we believe should not be uh, governed by market, uh, by market values and norms. This can actually be counterproductive and can lead to what uh, I have called elsewhere the tragedy of well-intentioned valuation. Uh, meaning that uh, your intentions can be the best, can be genuine and the best in the world, but uh, you, are, you may actually be creating um, discursive framings and te te technical te uh, te uh, metrical technology that paves the way for commodification to happen. We cannot separate valuation from commodification uh, within the existing uh, institutional setup. So, the key question, to value or not to value? Well, um, I have argued that way in a paper with, with my colleague Giorgos Kalis that this is not the question. Uh, actually, what we need to do is to demarcate um, the first task we maybe have to undertake, uh, those of us which are working on valuation, is uh, which is the domain of market values and norms in environmental policy and which are the things we, we believe should be governed by other types of values and norms. Um, I guess that when Kant was saying in the realm of ends, everything has a price or a dignity, was exactly uh, talking about uh, this divide. So I think it's only when we have done that, uh, that we will be ready to decide which externalities we want to internalize in the market and which internalities we may want to externalize from the market and put it on the other types of logics. Um, I would like just to finish with the message that uh, in defining what should be inside and outside the market, um, technical criteria obviously matter. Substitutability of resources, excludability, uh, rivalry, etc. But ultimately, is, uh, and most decisively maybe, it's a political and ethical dilemma about how a given culture wants uh, to govern nature and given types of ecosystem services. The way I see it is um, that we are facing an enormous challenge in the 21st century where we have uh, to design a new institutional structure for the governance of the commons, uh, which are not in place nowadays. Uh, and I see two competing frames clashing right now. The idea of understanding uh, these ecosystem services as potential commodities that can be traded in markets where markets would be the leading institutional structure, or the idea of uh, ecosystem services as ecological commons uh, that will need, in my opinion, uh, much stronger levels of public policy regulation and international cooperation if we want to address this challenge for the 21st century. Thanks very much for your uh, patience. I talked too long. Yeah.